All right. Uh, so hi, everyone. It's good to see you. Good turnout. Um, I'm Adam Williamson. I work for Red Hat on the Fedora QA team. Um, so I actually wanted to start out by asking a little about you guys so I can tailor my talk. Um, so how many people here are like existing Fedora users? Who are, okay. And I guess, so that's about half the room. I guess you guys are kind of interested in the where's Fedora going portion of this talk. That's probably what you guys are looking for. Cool. And the rest of you, um, are you looking for kind of a Fedora 101, like basic background? What the hell is Some it? Some of us tried Fedora like at one. <laughs> kind of right. It, it got better. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I um, all right, cool. So I'm going to kind of, I'll, I'll try and do kind of a 50-50 split on what I got here, because I got a history, and then I've got the present, and then I've got the future. So let's blow through the history relatively fast. So yeah, we're going to start out with a brief history of Fedora today, and then the future of Fedora. A brief history of Fedora. So, um, Fedora all started out with Red Hat Linux um, a long, long time ago in a galaxy far away. Uh, the world was very different, and people were trying to figure out, you know, Linux was this new exciting way to run Unixy things on PCs for not much money. And people, enthusiasts, people a lot like you, only your 20 year ago predecessors, wanted to be able to run Linux on their computers. So various people would try and bundle up, you know, enough software to have an entire operating system and then send it out to people. And Red Hat Linux was one of the earlier distributions. Um, it became a company and they tried to sell operating systems in boxes, which was the, the deal at the time. You put your operating system in the shiny box and put it on the shelf at Best Buy and tried to get people to pay you 80 bucks for it. And this was how Red Hat went from 1994 to 2003 when Red Hat Linux 9 came out. Um, this is a screenshot of Red Hat Linux 9, which I pulled up from Wikipedia. It's a uh, licensed GPLv3+. So, uh, <laughs> so at this time, around 2000 to 2003, Red Hat sort of backed into the business model it more or less still has today, where they realized that trying to sell an operating system to an individual geek for $80 is not a great business model, and no one has ever managed to make much money doing this. <laughs> But they managed to back into the business sort of server uh, market and realize this was where the real money was. Um, I've heard tell, and I don't know how true this is, but it's kind of an internal rumor that one of Red Hat's largest early markets was uh, porn sites who needed, you know, cheap, reliable, large-scale servers. So that's, you know, that's where Red Hat came from. So they were sort of developing into this market, and they realized that they didn't really want to be in the business of producing an entire individual person operating system with a desktop on a commercial level and trying to sell it to people anymore. So what they decided to do was that on the commercial side they were going to focus on server sales and we were going to have this product called uh, originally Red Hat Advanced Server which became Red Hat Enterprise Linux and that was the thing that we'd sell to people and make money. And then they didn't want to lose their connection to the to the, the enthusiast community, to the user base, because this is a valuable thing to have. We want people like you on our side, even if you aren't giving us money directly, right? So the decision was to kind of split things in two, and we'd have the big, shiny, serious enterprise side, and then we'd have a community distribution, Fedora. Uh, Fedora was actually a pre-existing community and project which provided additional packages for Red Hat Linux, but there was a kind of mind meld that went on. I don't know the details because I wasn't there at the time, and we wound up with an operating system called Fedora Core, which was, as it says there, more or less Red Hat 9 with the serial numbers filed off. It really wasn't very different. Um, but it was all rebranded, and the big deal was, you know, we put it out there for free. You could go and download it. Um, you didn't have to pay anything. We didn't want you to pay us anything. You couldn't pay us anything. And the idea was to try and get the community together with the Red Hat staff to develop something in collaboration. Um, and Red Hat, th and again, this is still how we do things to this day, more or less. Red Hat would then take Fedora and use it as a base for all the shiny products it would try and sell to enterprise people. And this, so it's been since 2003, this basic model has been in place. Um, so from there, at the time, um, there was still a split in a sense between, yeah, let's start with this slide, between Red Hat and the community. 
Uh, there was Fedora Core, which was the central part of the operating system, all the really important bits, the kernel, the desktop, the init system, blah, 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 blah. And at the time, only Red Hat staff could, maintain, could actually maintain that stuff. You could see it. It was all out in public, but no one else had commit access to it. Then there was extras, which was everything else. And this was, this was where the community could maintain things, contribute things. Um, so then the next sort of big step in Fedora's evolution was in 2007 with Fedora 7, uh, which was no longer Fedora Core 7, it was Fedora 7. And there was a merge between core and extras. And at that point, uh, in the old system, things were kind of maintained differently. Like there were different build systems. There was a Red Hat internal build system, which Fedora Core came out of, and a public build system, which extras came out of. There was a big overhaul at that time uh, to use a unified build system, which is called Koji, which we still use today a unified uh, update system called Bodhi, which we still use today. Uh, the actual release pipeline was sort of overhauled a little bit, so now we had live images, which we didn't have before. So this was kind of a big point in Fedora's history where it became, it became more of a genuinely, not independent, but cohesive community that was identifiably different from Red Hat itself. Then we're gonna skip forward again, because again, I'm trying to keep this part not too long. The next, we, there was various stuff that happened, obviously, between 2007 2014. You know, we do stuff, and we'll come to that in, in a little while. But the next really big overhaul to Fedora was what we called Fedora.next, which was a couple of years ago with Fedora 21. And up until this point, ultimately, we were still shipping an operating system. It was still connected back to that 1994 idea of the operating system in a shiny box. You didn't get a shiny box anymore, but we were you could get a KDE version, you could get a GNOME version, but basically we were trying to give you a big bunch of bits in a box and let you do stuff with it. We didn't have much focus around, hey, maybe this person wants to do this, maybe this person wants to do this. So the I big idea with Fedora Next was we, were, we tried to focus in on specific use cases. There's um, workstation, server, and at the time, cloud. And we said, okay, we defined an audience for each of these, we defined the core needs for each of these, we defined the core components of each of these, and organizationally, we set up working groups within Fedora, and we said, okay, your responsibility is Fedora server. Your responsibility is Fedora workstation, which isn't something we had before. Uh, so this was, I think, generally considered quite successful, we're quite happy with it. It allowed us to rebrand the website, all sorts of things, and really have much more focus around. Now when you go and see what is Fedora, what do I want, you can pick one of these use cases. It just sort of made things a lot more focused and it helped with our internal organization as well. So yeah, um, I did, as I said, other things did happen, so I thought I'd throw up a few sort of key events through Fedora history just for fun here. Um, so far as other architectures go, we had PowerPC support for quite a long time, mainly to run on old Macs. Uh, so from Fedora Core 4 up until like 10 or 11 or something, we had PowerPC support. ARM, there's been a second, there's been a kind of secondary arch project, which is like a, a sort of interest group who try to get things running on ARM since Fedora Core 6. But from Fedora 20, ARM has been a primary architecture, and it's on the same level as x86-64 for um, various supported ARM platforms. So, you know, that gets released at the same time. If they don't work, the release is blocked, all of this stuff. Um, as I'm a QA guy, I kind of have a focus on quality stuff. So I find the release criteria quite important. <laughs> Fedora 13 in 2009 was the first time we decided, hey, it'd probably be a really good idea to to formalize when is this thing good? When is this thing ready to send out to all you people? So we went through a whole process and put that together in 2009. This git, I don't see Jesse Keating here, unfortunately, but the guy who wrote this git is actually at this conference. Um, so Fedora packages, they're built out of files, and we used to keep the, the sources for the packages in CVS. Uh, some of you are old enough to remember CVS, I think. And then in 2010, we had a major change, and now the sources for the packages are kept in Git. And that was, you know, it was, I mean, Git had been around for quite a long time at that point, but we were still one of the earlier projects to use it on a really big scale, so that was pretty fun. We started releasing images to EC2 in 2010, which is quite a long time ago now, so we have been in the cloud for a while. Uh, does everyone know what EC2 is, or should I explain it for anyone? No? Okay, you're good, great. 
And Fedora 15 was a very large release. Uh, everybody's favorite Linux components both landed in Fedora 15, <laughs> Systemd and GNOME 3. So, you know, that one was a great release to jump on as your first Fedora. It was super polished and everything worked fantastically. Um, <laughs> and we redesigned the Fedora installer. Uh, our friend Brian Lane here is to blame for this. No, I'm kidding, right? <laughs> In 2013, which was another, you know, big change. If you're an existing Fedora user, you know that one was kind of a... It got better. It did get better. Um, and then Project Atomic, which we're going to talk about some more, but that has been around since Fedora 20 in 2013, and that's, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll get to that later, so if you don't know what it is, hold on. Question? The basic question is, is the Fedora organization supported directly by Red Hat? Yes. So the relationship between Red Hat and Fedora is a little bit complex, I won't go into it too deeply, but fundamentally Red Hat, if push comes to shove, Red Hat controls Fedora. Red Hat owns the Fedora trademarks. Red Hat financially supports Fedora to a large degree. Um, and the way Fedora's governance is constructed, day to day Fedora has a lot of independence from Red Hat. Red Hat doesn't tell us what to do, doesn't sit there over our shoulders, but if anything really controversial came up, it's structured such that Red Hat would basically be able to decide what happened. And we used to kind of hedge around this, but we decided, you know, it's silly. People who are interested in Fedora don't think Red Hat is the big bad evil, so we're just going to be straightforward about it. So yeah, ultimately, on a day-to-day -day basis, there's a lot of independence, it's, we're not handheld by you know, Red Hat central office, but ultimately Red Hat kind of is in charge. Uh, and since I'm trying to do, give an overview here, this is kind of a very brief history of the Fedora community, or at least certain aspects of it. I certainly am not plugged into everything. Uh, FUDCON was the Fedora conference. Uh, we've had Fedora conference, you know, we had conferences since 2005 to 2013. Uh, we still have global FUDCONs, as in uh, different geographies, we call them. Europe and Asia is one. Uh, no, Europe is one. Asia Pacific is one. Europe and the Middle East is another. Anyway, we have FUDCONs, like local FUDCONs there. Uh, the f conference was rebranded as Flock in 2013, so we've run Flocks annually since 2013. And uh, every year, like, it alternates. One year it'll be in North America, the next year it'll be somewhere else. North America again, somewhere else. We've had, uh, FWN is Fedora Weekly News. So this is, you know, the way we send information out to the community. That ran for seven years, and it's been replaced by the Fedora Magazine, which is a website where interesting articles about Fedora get published. And that's a great thing to follow if you, you know, want to keep up to date with what's going on day to day in Fedora. So you can find it easily. You just Google Fedora Magazine. Uh, Planet Fedora is a blog aggregator, so anyone who blogs about Fedora can join into the planet, and then you can go to the planet and read all their blogs together, and that's been around for, you know, a decade. Fedora Forum is not officially, it's kind of a semi-official thing. We let them use the Fedora trademark, but it's not really part of the Fedora project, and that's a web forum where you can go and chat and get help. That's been around for, you know, 13 years now. Wow, long time. And Ambassadors is our kind of uh, outreach project. You might call them evangelists. Anyone here a Fedora Ambassador, by the way? Are you? I'm, I'm, okay. I'm not. You're not? It's really? I thought really you were. Hard to become a Fedora right, they have this whole process to go through, yeah. You have to know somebody and polish their boots, and <laughs> you can't make sure their car's got oil and all that kind of stuff. So you're, 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 you're like an unofficial Fedora Ambassador. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> right, but that's kind of our outreach project. It, it's how we organize a lot of things like this conference, although technically we're not run by an ambassador here. Um, it's the organization through which Fedora can fund people to go out and do outreach, have booths at community events, things like that. And also it, tends, it has an element of local help. You know, if you need some help with, if you're Indian and you need some help with input in India, then the local Fedora ambassador is probably a good person to go and talk to to try and get some help. Coper is, uh, well, I, do people here know Ubuntu's PPA thing? Coper is Fedora PPAs, basically. Um, it's where you, know, you can get your own repository and build some side packages, and it gives you all the infrastructure to do it easily. We've had that system since 2013, which has been quite successful as well, which is great to let people build stuff. So that's kind of you know, a very brief overview of Fedora's history. Fedora today. So we've, we've worked through all this history. Um, wait, that's not. Right? I just got this slide like five minutes ago, so I must not have hit save enough times. 
Let's find the Fedora Foundations. For anyone... There's also a Stack Overflow thing, too. Mm hmm? Isn't there? The Fedora questions or whatever? I... Oh, right, yeah. Ask ask Fedora, yeah, ask about yeah. Fedora Project. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff I haven't sort of overlaps covered here. Forms. Yeah, and there's the IRC channel. There's, there's a lot of stuff. So let's do this this way. The Fedora Foundations. I wanted to start with this because it gives a good overview of kind of where Fedora is at right now. We decided these a few releases back, and they're like our core values for what Fedora really is, what it stands for. Uh, freedom is a very important one. Um, so Fedora is still committed to software freedom and uh, con content freedom. Everything in Fedora, every project that Fedora releases is made up only of free and open source software. Um, our definition of this varies from the Free Software Foundation on one small point, so they don't consider us officially free, but we consider ourselves officially free. The difference is that we um, accept proprietary firmware. Uh, which we define as code that doesn't run on the host CPU. So if your Wi-Fi card needs proprietary firmware, Fedora will ship that, and Free Software Foundation doesn't agree with us on that, but that's the only difference we have. Um, so we're still very big on that, uh, which can be a good thing if you're just interested in making your computer run, can potentially be a bad thing, but it's a core value of Fedora and a core definition of the Fedora project. When you just install Fedora itself, you're getting free software. Uh, friends, we... The community is an important thing to Fedora, and friends is the value that represents community. We, it's, as we talked about the relationship between Red Hat and Fedora, we're not an independent community project like Debian or something like that. But in practice, on a day-to-day -day level, things work more or less that way. Um, even the Red Hat people like myself who are involved in Fedora, most of us, we consider ourselves members of the Fedora community kind of first and foremost, and that's how we try to organize our work. I'm active with Fedora contributors and Fedora users every day, I'm much less active inside the Red Hat hierarchy. So we, we try to keep a focus on having a genuine community where your importance, worth, value, however you want to say it, is defined by your contributions to Fedora and not your relationship to Red Hat. Um, features, I always think this one's a bit of a hand wave because someone wanted four foundations and we got the we got first friends and freedom, then someone's like, damn it, we need one more. Features. Everybody loves features. So yeah, we yeah, we, we make software with lots of features. Yeah. First is a much more important one, uh, in my entirely unbiased opinion. So this is another really key definition of Fedora. Um, as I said, the relationship between Fedora and Red Hat in terms of what value Fedora brings to Red Hat is very similar to how it's been all along. What Fedora provides for Red Hat is a base to start things off from. Um, and I kind of think there's a philosopher who had a quote something along the lines of, if God didn't exist, we'd be forced to invent him. And if Fedora didn't exist, Red Hat would probably be forced to invent it. Uh, because it, Fedora is a very small project combined to the size of Red Hat, but we produce an entire functional, really quite good operating system with more stuff in it than anything Red Hat ships. And then Red Hat gets to take that and use it as a base for anything they ship. It's a very actually cost-efficient way, I think, for them to start off with some software. Um, so what this means for Fedora itself is that it's very important that we do new stuff. We stay on the cutting edge. We, stay on, we try not to stay on the bleeding edge, but we definitely want to stay on the cutting edge. We want to have new things, not just new versions of software, but new workflows. We want to stay up to date with how um, enthusiasts are using things. What you want to be playing with, we want to be providing. So first is a very important value. So I wanted to sort of go from there, and I'll fix this slide later, uh, to sort of give us a, give us a little overview. Um, so to go in on detail, on the distribution, what you have right now with Fedora, uh, this is a screenshot of Get Fedora, but it's probably easier for me just to go there and show it to you. If you want to start with Fedora right now, this is where you wind up, is getfedora.org. Um, and what you see are the flavors of Fedora. And if you remember the fedora.next slide, we had workstation, server, and cloud. And that organization is almost still there, but cloud has sort of changed into atomic. Um, so these are our three broad, most important, you know, sort of Fedora flavors that we, we're really focusing on right now. So if you go there, this, you pick one of these, first of all, and then you sort of drill down from there. 
Go back to the side. Um, and yeah, x86, 64, and ARM are our sort of main architectures right now, and that's where you'll focus. Yeah, sorry, I should have said. I'll take questions at any point. So if you have something to ask, please just stick a hand up. Yes. I'll try to be brief. One of the things about Fedora was you didn't want to use it on the server because it was too much churn. And so there's like two thirds of your thing is about servers. Yeah, this is an interesting point. Um, I think, should I address it now? Yeah, let's address it now. Uh, so we think Fedora is actually a good choice to use on servers in certain situations. Um, you probably don't want to run your enterprise database server on Fedora because you don't need your database server to change very much and you do need it to be very stable and reliable. Uh, so for classic old school service situations like that in production, yeah, we're not, we don't have a big emphasis on using Fedora for that. Um, but what we do think is that if you're doing, if you're working on newer stuff with your servers and maybe you have a test deployment or you have a smaller deployment that you want to, you want to see what's coming up in new versions of, you want to check if your stuff's going to run on newer kernels, on newer Apache, on, you, maybe you want to play around with Nginx and you haven't played around with it before, stuff like that. Maybe you want to play around with shiny new database technologies. We think Fedora is a good way to do that. Um, Atomic, again, I mean, we're, I, we're going to get into that in more detail later, but it's shiny new stuff. And the place where Red Hat does shiny new stuff is in Fedora. And like when, if you want to be playing around with our shiny new stuff before we've really worked out exactly how we want everyone to use it and shipped an expensive Red Hat Atomic product, then Fedora is the place to be doing that. The other thing I'd say is that in practice, if you don't mind updating when the updates are there, Fedora server actually, I run all my personal servers on Fedora and I upgrade them every two releases and Stuff goes wrong on upgrade occasionally. Stuff always goes wrong on upgrade occasionally, but I've never had to take more than four or five hours to get everything working again. So out of every 13 months, four or five hours isn't that bad. That four or five system hours or four or five hours? Of Human hours. Developers, like, you have to fix code and all that. Usually it's just configuration stuff. The yeah. most common thing I have is like, oh, I didn't upgrade and something I do causes SE Linux denial, so I'll have to set up a local SE Linux policy, something like that. At the application level, you don't normally have to have not usually, and sometimes there's a new version of an application. I have to, it's not backwards compatible without me doing something, that kind of thing. It, it, it would be annoying if you were running a giant server farm. If you're running a personal server, it's actually not a huge well, deal. Well, once you know the changes, you can automate it. <laughs> yeah. You throw Ansible at it, and you can upgrade. Yeah. The, the sure. upgrade story with Fedora is has got a lot better. Yeah. yeah. Since the time you were using Fedora, we used it's to. Very painful. It used yeah, to be the, the if you asked us how to upgrade Fedora, we'd say, well, you can do this, but you probably just want to throw it away and start over. Yeah. We don't say that anymore. My, the upgrades work a lot my better. My development now. server has been upgraded since Fedora. I think I checked it the other day. It was like 19. Yeah, my desktop started as 15. Now. It's 26 now. So, yeah. you know, for just, just desktop like upgrade path, <laughs> it, it's actually working pretty good. Yeah, we, we made the technology better. <laughs> Sorry, there was another question in the back. Does, is there any overlap between the Fedora server and... Um, overlap, so CentOS is still basically uh, debranded Red Hat. Um, I don't know if anyone doesn't know the background. Um, so we talked about Red Hat's business model earlier, and the business model is that we sell you, you know, shiny server operating systems. That's not quite it. We sell you support for shiny server operating systems. The way the licensing works, it's legal for someone to take Red Hat, take all the Red Hat branding off of it, because we have trademarks and copyrights in the branding, um, call it something else and then ship that. Um, and there was a project called CentOS which did this um, independent project for a long time. Um, and Red Hat a couple of years ago now basically bought out CentOS. I, I don't know the official legal way to describe the relationship but that's basically what happened. And now CentOS is a part of Red Hat. But the project still operates more or less in the same way and you can still go and download CentOS and you're effectively getting Red Hat for free but without the Red Hat certifications and branding and Red Hat support. Um, there isn't a lot of direct overlap in that sense. I mean, Red Hat releases still branch off Fedora releases ultimately. Um, so any given CentOS release is going to be kind of like a Fedora release underneath. And we're, I, I'm trying to piece together the, the okay, a feature first appears in, in Red Fedora. 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 Everything that's going to go in, well, not quite everything, but generally things that are going to appear in Red Hat appear in Fedora first. Um, yeah. 
it's we filters out the rel, rel which and CentOS is fi CentOS files the serial numbers off rel and okay. and you get it there. That's kind of that's how the relationship works. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's how that relationship works. And there's things in that area may change in the future, and maybe I'll talk about that when we get to the future section of the talk. Uh, so yeah, but just to give a brief overview of you know current, this is, if you're getting into Fedora right now, you're gonna get to that page and you're gonna see Workstation Server and Atomic. Workstation, Workstation is our, you know, I'm talking a lot about change here, but fundamentally, people like yourselves, most enthusiasts want to download, you know, an image, boot it up on their laptops and see a desktop. And that's what Workstation is, you know, your basic, the distribution that has changed the least since 1994, right? I showed that screenshot of Red Hat Linux 9 and, you know, screenshot of Workstation. It's GNOME 3 now, not GNOME 2, but more or less the same thing. That's what Workstation is. Uh, when we went through the Fedora Next process, we tried to focus in a little bit on our main target use case, um, and we call them developers, but it really represents the people who want to play around with things. Hot, and that's actually taken from the, uh, the, the workstation foundational document, I can't remember what it's called, but from hobbyists and students to corporate developers. But it's also the subsidiary audience is the wide general audience. So really this is just a case of focusing. And when we need to make a decision, okay, we're gonna think about developers. But it's that kind of general audience district. Well, the budget would have mentioned it later or not, but mm. there are all those spins. So if you don't want to know That comes up on like know. the next but three slide, sense. yeah. But this is, you know, this, the focus part is like, okay, we decided workstation is our primary. Yes, another question over there. So is the, you know, the choosing the name workstation, is it meant more towards, meant more towards business? Business, but it was the it, it's developer workstation. That's where the, the workstation word comes from. That was really the at first we thought developer workstation, and then took it to workstation. It's not really about business. It's more about people who are trying. Uh, developing was kind of a focus, especially at the start. We had this thing called Dev Assistant, which was sort of to help you set up a code project really quickly. And that we're still kind of thinking down those lines. We want to make life easy for people who tinker around with computers. Um, Server, uh, so yeah, server is a kind of traditional server distribution. It's like um, if you're running, if you want to set up an entire system, whether it's an actual bare metal computer or a virtual machine as a server, a web server, a database server, something like that, server is the distribution for that. Um, as it was originally conceived, there were two major features of it. Um, the cockpit management interface, which I think I have a screenshot of, is pretty cool and server roles. So Cockpit is this thing uh, which Red Hat built. Um, it's kind of like Webmin, only you know modern and secure and not written in PHP, and it's actually really cool. Uh, so anytime you install a Fedora server system, uh, on port 9090, which is actually an officially defined port now, Cockpit will be running, and you can just log straight into that, and you get a management interface for the system. You can just log in with root, uh, root username and password, and you can do a bunch of stuff on the system, you know, graphically. I think this was kind of inspired by Microsoft has a really cool server admin interface, and we kind of thought, you know what, a lot of people would prefer something like this than a bash prompt as the first thing they see on their shiny new server. So Cockpit is for that. Cockpit is actually a really amazing project. It's built, it's got a, I don't know if you can really see, but you've got system, logs, storage, networking, accounts, and services. You can do a lot of system admin tasks from this interface. It does some really advanced stuff. There's a join domain button there. You can enroll the system in an active directory or free IPA domain, like right from this interface. It's, it's pretty neat. And it's, it's, it's developed very rapidly. It has a really good CI, CD um, workflow, so they could add new features and nothing ever breaks in the cockpit. I mean, it's like, it's super, super reliable. So I love this project. So that's a really neat part of server. Uh, the other part of server was this thing called server roles. The idea being we would provide a system that made it easy for you to set up certain common server types out of the box. So the two that are there and tested and functional are um, a domain controller role, which sets you up. Uh, has anyone heard of Free IPA? It's a Red Hat technology of all these guys, obviously. Uh, you've heard of Active Domain, Active Directory? Which one is it? Active Directory, which is the Microsoft, uh, it's like, you know, if you want to have combined identity and services for a big farm of systems. Uh, it's a system for doing that. Uh, we have a thing called free IPA or Red Hat Directory Services or something, which is the, you know, a free counterpart to that. 
And you can set up a Fedora server as a pre IPA domain controller um, using one of these server roles. There's also a database server role. Yep. Uh, it's, we're kind of getting off track there, but to a degree, yeah, uh, it gets complicated. Um, but yeah, you, you can, you can, it's interoperable in the sense that if you've got an Active Directory domain and a free IPA domain, you can kind of share trust across them and stuff. But yeah, you, I run a free IPA setup for myself. I don't run an Active Directory setup, so I don't have all the technical details, and it's also a complex topic. So there are people I can direct you to who can give you more accurate details on that than I would be able to. If you're forced to run a Windows server, you could affiliate with Yeah, you could, there is some way of kind of mode and mind melding so that trust is shared between the two. Anyway, the point was that's one of the roles you can set up. Another is a database server role. This is getting rethought right now because the whole system that we wrote to do this was kind of written from scratch uh, by a guy called Stephen Gallagher, who's great. Uh, but it, and then Ansible came along. And we kind of got to a point where we realized, hey, this server role system is basically doing a lot of the same things you could do with an Ansible playbook. So we're right now we're kind of rewriting this around Ansible. Um, and then that will integrate with Cockpit, which will be the cool thing. So you can just go to Cockpit and say, hey, I want to deploy this server as a database server. I want to deploy it as a web server. It's, and it'll do it, and it all uses Ansible on the back end. Uh, Ansible is a sort of task automation configuration management thing like Puppet or Salt or Chef, for those of you who haven't heard of it. Uh, but, you know, the concept is still there. We're rewriting how it's implemented, but the idea that it should be easy to install a server and then go to a nice graphical interface and say, I want this to be a database server, bonk, here's the button. Common workflows easily implemented, so you don't have to do a lot of grunt work yourself. It's kind of the concept behind server. <laughs> then Atomic. Uh, as I said, you may remember on the slide, the original idea here was cloud. Um, so the core idea was, hey, we noticed this cloud thing is getting important. People, it would be good if people can run Fedora on their cloud instances. So what we started out with at Fedora 21 was um, basically a really minimal Fedora install, which was shipped as a disk image and then an EC2 you know, instance profile, whatever they call it. So you could just, and it, we had it in OpenStack and some other cloud systems as well. So you could go to a, any one of these cloud systems and just say, hey, I want a Fedora instance, and you'd get a basic. But it was, it was still basically a Fedora install. It was like any other Fedora install. It was just a very small one. It still used RPM, still used DRM, all that stuff. DNF, whichever it was in 21. Um, since then, this project called uh, Project Atomic came along, and the idea so Atomic is based on this thing called OS Tree, uh, which is a different way of building a core operating system. It, we ultimately build the images from RPM packages. But what you get, you don't manage it using RPM. You, it's, you get kind of like a snapshot of a base system that can be um, updated atomically, then can be rolled back to the previous versions and stuff like this. It's an entirely different way of managing and implementing a core operating system. And we figured that this was actually very appropriate for cloud instances, because this is how people want to maintain. Generally, if you're deploying something to the cloud, you want a very small core operating system, and then you're going to deploy something on top of it. Commonly, you're not going to do that using distribution software. You're often going to want to run containers on top of it, or you're going to want to take something from you know, the PHP ecosystem, the Node.js ecosystem, something like that, and deploy it on top. You don't care about what the distribution is providing you, except the very core OS. And you want the core OS to be easy to deploy, easy to update, easy to roll back. So there was a natural overlap between OS tree and cloud usage here. So we kind of moved away from this cloud image, which was a traditional Fedora image. It still exists, but it's not what we promote to people for cloud use now. Um, and we moved to this thing called Fedora Atomic Host, which is this, it's still a very small, minimal OS image that you deploy into a cloud, but the way you maintain it is different, and it has some unique advantages for cloud deployment. Um, the other interesting thing about Atomic Host is it has an entirely different release cycle from the rest of Fedora, and this is going to filter back into the talk later. Uh, Fedora, I'm going to mention the Fedora release cycle later, but very briefly, we release new Fedora releases every six months. And again, this is a very old concept. It goes back to 1994. You know, you got your operating system in a box from Best Buy, and every so often we'd have to put new bits in a box and change the design on the box and put it on the shelf. So we're still basically doing that. Every six months we're giving you updated 
things. Atomic Host doesn't really work that way. Um, Atomic Host starts from a Fedora stable release, but then we build a new image from updated packages every two weeks. Uh, well, no, we build it every night. Um, and then it's automatically tested to check that it basically works. You can boot up Docker images on it. Uh, you can start Docker images on it, stuff like that. Sorry, Docker containers on it. Um, and then every two weeks, we take the most recent image which passed all the tests, and that gets shipped out. So if you go and download Fedora 25 Atomic Host right now, you don't get an image which was built from the Fedora 25 release day bits. You get an image which was built in the last two weeks from all the most recent Fedora 25 packages. And if you have a deployed system, when you update it, what you get is the latest two-week snapshot. So as well as demonstrating this new OS tree technology and letting us play around with that and getting advantage from that, it's, this is also letting us think about how we do different release cycles rather than a whole bunch of new bits every six months. Um, so yeah, someone mentioned spins. Was it green? It was you. All right, thank you. You were way ahead of me here. Um, we tried to focus down on these three really core use cases, and for various reasons, these three cases actually pass out to about 15 or 20 images. Um, but we also still provide other desktops than GNOME. There's a KDE live spin, we call it. There's a Cinnamon. There's an LXD. There's an XFC. There's an LXQT. There's a everything. I don't know what the hell else we have. Um, there's some specialized things. There's a security spin if you're really interested in uh, like pen testing and stuff like that. There's a spin which comes preloaded with a bunch of pen testing software. It's called the security spin. There's stuff like this. We have um, you know, procedures for where people can build these and they get released along with the rest of the distribution. So that means that we have uh, Fedora 25 shipped a total of 53 different images. <laughs> Fedora 26 nightlies currently have 58. Um, uh, which is you know, significant to me because I get to test them all, uh, or at least the ones that are release blocking. So this is an interesting challenge to deal with these days. I, wa I want to do a nice graph which goes up over time and says, you know, Fedora Core 1 had six images, and, but I haven't quite managed to plot that out yet. Uh, so yeah, the Fedora life cycle, this is where we're at right now. This is how everything except Atomic Host works. Uh, so yeah, we're still harking back to the model of there is an operating system, and you can have a new version of it every so often. So every six months, we ship a new Fedora. Right now, the most current stable is Fedora 25. 26 is supposed to come out next month, I think. Um, and then each release is supported until one month after the next but one release comes out, which is a mouthful to say. But basically, uh, if you're running Fedora 25, it'll be supported until one month after Fedora 27 comes out. The idea of this is that you don't have to update every six months. If you are running a server, you can update every 12 months instead, which is slightly less bad. Um, and it also, if one releases a complete lemon on your hardware or something, you can just stick with the previous one and wait for the next one. Um, we have regular updates, um, as opposed to new releases of the entire distribution. You know, we just ship updates for the, the stuff in the current distribution. Uh, Fedora specifically here is a little more adventurous than a lot of distributions. Um, Ubuntu's update policy is quite focused on only fixing security issues and major bugs. Fedora, we tend to ship, we fix security issues and bugs, obviously. Many packages will also ship uh, just new releases of the software if they're backwards compatible. Um, I mean, all distributions do it for stuff like Firefox, but more applications in Fedora you'll get updates for on a regular basis, which is good if you want shiny new features. Maybe bad if you don't like downloading huge amounts of data or new bugs. It's a trade-off. But that's Fedora is first, right? So that's part of the first foundation. Um, we ship kernel point releases as updates is a quite important feature of Fedora. Um, we didn't used to. It used to be whichever kernel version came with the release was the kernel version for the life of that release. But we changed it a few releases back because it's just, even for 12 months, it's difficult to maintain the security of a kernel that upstream isn't maintaining the security on. So basically, you know, right now, Fedora 25 is on kernel 4.10. A little while after 4.11 comes out, Fedora 25 will get for kernel 4.11, yes. How close to the mainline kernel are you? Pretty close. Um, there's a lot of Fedora kernel developers are upstream developers too, and we work really hard to push everything we want to change upstream. I think there's a f very few things that we really want in Fedora that upstream doesn't want to merge for some reason. That's like three or four patches. It's nothing huge. And then otherwise, we kind of have you know maybe five or six patches that are 
just haven't gone through the whole process, but they're on the line to get merged upstream usually. It's so very nearly identical. Pretty close, yeah. Uh, usually you can file bugs. If you get a kernel bug in Fedora, you can just file it upstream, and it's almost always going to be accepted. They won't be like, oh, you're running a distribution kernel. No, usually it'll be fine. Um, upgrades as opposed to updates, that's a version bump. So when you're going to from Fedora 24 to 25 to 26, we were talking about this in the corner right here. Historically, this was famously a weak point for Fedora. Um, if you tried to upgrade your system, you probably had about a 50-50 shot at it, maybe a 30-70 shot at it. Uh, it's now a lot more like 90-10. Um, we have there were various iterations of trying to make the upgrade process better, and we've got pretty good at it now. It's basically a system which figures out the packages that need updating, downloads them all to a side, Place, reboots the system to a very minimal environment, installs all the updated packages, and then boots back. And we test this. We have automated testing for it. We test it quite hard. Bugs in it block the release. So we try and keep the upgrade path working really pretty well. So you can upgrade from release to release without having to reinstall, and it works pretty well these days. I was saying earlier, my desktop started out Fedora 15. It's now running a 26 pre-release. So. How much tension does that create when it comes to deciding, hey, this new feature is going to break backwards compatibility? Uh, it's, it's not as much of a problem as you'd think. The last time we had a really big one like that was actually the Grub2 migration, which I think was Fedora 17. There just hasn't been anything come out since then which we couldn't cope with. The system where you reboot to a minimal environment and do the upgrade there helps a lot. And there's actually even a setup where if you need to, it can do the upgrade, it can upgrade certain components even earlier. It can do it basically from the init RAMFS, but we've never actually had to use that so far. So yeah, it's, the technology helps with that. Uh, how are we doing for time here? Is this a one hour slot? Okay, I will be quick through this then. Um, just a very brief overview of Fedora's infrastructure. We have a build system called Koji. That's where you maintainers do package builds. Other stuff happens in it too. An update system called Bodhi. Um, so when you're trying to ship an update to a stable Fedora release, you can't just, as a packager, you can't just send it out. It has to go through this testing process. You ship it, people who have the testing repositories enabled can install it and try it out and see if it works and send feedback. And then once it's been sitting there without negative feedback for long enough, or it gets enough positive feedback, then you can ship it to regular users who don't have the testing repository enabled. The system that handles this is called Bodhi. Uh, composing the entire distribution, the way we build those 58 images is this thing called Punji, uh, which this was another big change a few releases back. Uh, the way Fedora did this and the way Red Hat did it had kind of diverged, and we merged them back together into Punji 4, uh, which isn't really just a new version of Punji, but is nearly a new tool, and it's, it's a better tool. It produces lots of metadata. It's, it's pretty good. Messaging, this is a cool thing we have. Um, this doesn't mean messaging like Skype. Uh, it's, we have a, me a sort of project-wide message bus uh, called FedMessage. So what that means is, say a new Compose has just been finished, this, uh, the Compose system will send a message out on the fed message message bus, and anything else, anyone can listen to it. It's a public system. You can subscribe to it and get a message every time the Compose completes. You can get a message every time the wiki is edited. You get a message every time a comment is added to a bug. It's this huge, all-encompassing system. And the neat thing about it is it lets us have events trigger off other events in a standardized way. So as I'm in QA, when a compose completes, a message gets emitted on the system, one of our automated testing systems listens out for those messages and says, oh, there's a new compose. It lives here because the message tells you where it lives. I should run off and download it and run some tests on it. So it's a really neat system for doing that. Um, I believe Debian thought about deploying fed message but couldn't quite get it done. And SUSE have a similar but different system built on, I think, ActiveMQ or something like that. Uh, FMN is like the user-friendly system built on top of FedMessage. You wouldn't actually want to build your own system to listen to the message bus and send you neat little text alerts for things you care about because we built that for you. It's called FMN. So if you're a Fedora contributor, you can go to this site and you can, it gives you a nice friendly interface and you can say, hey, I want to get an email when this happens. I want to get an IRC ping when this happens. It's, it's a pretty neat thing. So look up FMN if you're interested in that. Uh, forge, a forge is the term you use to describe something like GitHub. 
Uh, we have this thing called Pagger, which is basically a GitHub clone written in Python, um, where a lot of Fedora projects live, and also Fedora groups are using it to track issues and things now. We used to use a track instance. We now use Pagger for a lot of groups. Fedora QA has a Pagger where we track tests. We have a lot of automated testing, which we didn't have three or four years ago. Um, and again, I'm trying to be fast here, but we do, we run tests on updates. Uh, we run tests on distribution composers. These are all plugged back in, in various feedback loops using FedMessage. Uh, we also use a system called AutoCloud to run tests on cloud images, and that handles the atomic host two week release cycle thing. Uh, we use Bugzilla for tracking bugs and package review. Uh, we use Red Hat's Bugzilla instance, which can be, it can present some challenges sometimes because, you know, it's, it's trying to serve a lot of groups. It tracks bugs for Fedora and Red Hat Linux and a bunch of other Red Hat projects. But anyway, I won't go too far into that. That's what we use. Community. We have all of these people in the Fedora community, and they're all great people. We have people who build the distribution, basically. Packages who build our packages, developers who work on all the Fedora tools, and the amazing Fedora infrastructure team which is really like three people plus 15 clones of Patrick Uterwick, uh, who do all this work to keep everything running, which is amazing. We have a great design community who design the website. They design the branding for Fedora. They make everything look pretty cool. We have a lot of people helping out with support um, on places like the forums, the IRC channel, Ask Fedora, the mailing lists. We have a lot of translators. Fedora is pretty well translated into a lot of languages. Uh, we have a great testing community who uh, helped me out a lot. And we have the ambassadors who go out and do outreach. So we have a pretty big community covering a lot of um, areas. And there's a site called Join Fedora, which you can go to if you're interested in helping out with any of these. And it's kind of like a central dispatch point for finding out how you can get involved. So I now have about 15 minutes for the future of Fedora, which wasn't my intent, but let's do it. Uh, the first so. I want to talk about like why do we need, this is a point in history where we do need to be rethinking a lot of things. And we're doing that. These are the reasons why. Uh, so anyone here know um, Dan? Uh, Dan Walsh, who is the SE Linux, well, he's not anymore, but he was kind of like the SE Linux guy for a long time. He has a very unique way of saying Docker, 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 which uh, that first bullet point is a joke about. Uh, so the point here is that Docker came along and it changed a lot of stuff. Uh, people are very interested in the basic way of doing things that Docker presents. So if you're not familiar with Docker, it's, um, it's a container system and that's a way of isolating stuff on a system that's less heavy than running an entire virtual machine. Um, it's heavier than a cheroot, but it's less heavy than a virtual machine. And what this allows you to do basically is um, run some software on your system in a way that's very divorced from the host system. You can set up a container that um, spins up a web server and provides a web service which isn't using barely anything at all from your host system. It's, like it's got an entire stack of bits in the container that came from somewhere else. They didn't come from your distribution provider. They're not updated by your distribution provider. Um, and you can run like five of these containers on one system. There are whole complex systems for orchestrating them across multiple servers to provide bigger services. But it's a completely different model for running software from the one that Fedora has traditionally been developed around. Fedora is still developed around, you know, Fedora server. You install it on your system, and then when you want some software, you type DNF install blah blah. And it comes from the distribution repositories, it's installed on the host software, you run everything on the host system together. Docker is not at all like that. And for a Linux distribution, you have to think, well, if everyone wants to run things in containers, what does that mean for us? So that's one input. Language ecosystems. This is stuff like um, PHPs, um, the Node.js one, NPM, PIP for Python, where, again, the historic way you got software on Linux was to get it from your distribution provider. Otherwise, you know, maybe you could download something from a website, but it was pretty shonky. Most people didn't do that. There are now a lot of sort of independent third-party ecosystems you can go to and get software from. They're often built around um, programming language communities. So if you type, you know, pip install blah blah, you're getting a Python module that hasn't come from Fedora, or if you're on Ubuntu, it hasn't come from Ubuntu. It's an entirely independent system. Um, and this is becoming more and more popular. Um, 
and there's a whole workflow where you know you use a language ecosystem to get a bunch of packages so you can build something and then you put your finished product into a container and ship that out to the world and all of this is kind of entirely to the side of what a Linux distribution does. So as a Linux distribution, we have to think, how do we interface with that? How do we make sense in a world where this is how people do things? Differing life cycles. Again, this, this is one that's been around a long time, but it's just getting more and more obvious. Um, you know, Again, we ship a single bucket of software that all has to work together so you can install it on the same system at the same time, and we do it every six months. The kernel's on one life cycle, GNOME's on one life cycle, KDE's on one life cycle. All these different bits of software are on different life cycles. And often, if whatever you're doing on your computer, you don't necessarily want all the bits to be updated at the same time on the same schedule. Um, so if you're you know, a web application developer, you want your web application bits to be as new as you possibly can. You want the latest every bit of your stack. But you don't want the latest kernel every day. You don't want the latest system D every day, right? Again, distribution methodologies aren't really built to enable this. So we have to think, how are we going to change things so we can live with this? Um, operating system application isolation. Uh, my favorite way to uh, illustrate this is about cell phones. Um, so when you have your, almost everyone has an Android or an iOS phone, right? Um, when the core software on your phone, when you install an application, these are completely different systems. Like if you get an update for Android or an update for iOS, that's a completely different thing from installing a new application or updating an application. They've, the core part of the operating system is built differently, delivered differently, updated differently from how your applications are. Again, traditionally for Linux distributions, this isn't the case. Um, the kernel is a package in Fedora. and Firefox is a package, and Nano is a package. They're all just packages, and we ship updates for them in the same way. We build them all in the same way. The OS application isolation model has a lot to be said for it in terms of security, enabling differing life cycles, all of this stuff. How do distributions think about that? If we want to implement it, how do we do that? This next one is another point that's close to my heart as a QA person. In with the new, in with the old. The problem here is... So we want to do stuff like Atomic Host, shiny, exciting, cutting edge stuff where you do things in different ways using Docker and blah, 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 blah. But a lot of people are actually still quite happy with the old way of doing things. And they, there's still a lot of people who still just want to get a virtual machine and install an off, a distribution on it, put their web server on it and run a web server. So as a distribution, especially one like Fedora with a tie to Red Hat who definitely has people who are in the, we want to do everything the old way bucket, we kind of have to try and enable the new thing and the old thing at the same time, which is a big challenge. And uh, less in importance of the OS, again, overlaps with a lot of the other points. It's just the operating system isn't the shiny, exciting place where things are happening anymore. For a long time it was, but now it kind of isn't. The operating system is something you just expect to be there, and then you're, all the shiny, exciting stuff is VR and robots, and it's all being done in containers and shiny, high-level programming languages. The operating system to a lot of people isn't an area of you know, interest in itself anymore. It's something that just has to sit there and work. Again, as a distribution, how do we think about that? So we have this whole sort of conflux of challenges coming our way, and we're trying to think about those. How do we refresh Fedora for all these new ways of operating while still catering to the audience of people who are happy with the old way of doing things? Uh, so challenges as in, what are the things in Fedora right now that make it hard for us to get to where we'd like to be? Again, this comes back to 1994. We still basically have, we have a pipeline. It's a really good pipeline that lets us build a monolithic operating system out of packages. It's very good at that. It's not terribly good at doing anything else. Um, at the bottom there, new capabilities hacked up ad hoc. Anything we've added onto it recently so we can build cloud images, atomic stuff has been kind of patched on to the old system in maybe not the way you would do it if you were building from scratch. So this has various limitations. We can't build small bits of the distribution very fast. I was talking to our release engineers last week, and to build anything besides a package for Fedora, we run through something called distribution compose process, which is really tuned to build everything, all 58 images, everything else, spit it all out in a big lump. If you want to just tell it, hey, I want to do a small compose and just build one image, the minimum time to do that is three hours. 
that's as fast as we can do it, <laughs> which isn't great if you want to build it every time someone does a commit to a certain package. You could, it's not going to work, right? Um, we don't have any implementation of operating system or app space separation right now, really. We just don't have it. We're working on it, but we don't have it. Missing infrastructure for full CI. Uh, CI is continuous integration. It's basically the idea that when you test things all the time, um, you often see it in small projects on GitHub. If you send a pull request, there'll be some kind of bot which um, sets up a branch, lands your pull request, and then runs the software's test suite on it. And then it'll put some kind of comment on your commit saying whether it passed or failed. If it failed, they won't accept your commit, right? Fairly simple concept. Trying to do that at five minutes, yeah. Trying to do that at the distribution level is something that we'd like to do. I know a lot of other distributions are interested in it. It's really hard. You need a lot of infrastructure to do anything like that at the level of an operating system. We would like to do it or get along that path. There's a lot of stuff missing in our our way of doing stuff that just means we can't really do it right now. Uh, so yeah, I wanted to point out at this point, Atomic Host, as I talked about, has it's been kind of blazing a trail for us in this sense. The big problem is that it's mostly separate from everything else. As I said, we've kind of glommed on a lot of stuff to our pipeline so we can do Atomic Host, but we couldn't do the other parts of our distribution in the way we do Atomic Host, but it's at least letting us think about this stuff. So the core OS is not RPM-based. You don't update it with DNF. Atomic Host actually does have, it's the only thing we have that has separation between the operating system and the apps because you can't install packages on it. Anything you want to deploy on it, you have to deploy as a flat pack or a Docker container, something like that. You have, or you know, do a pip install, but you can't run DNF install nano. You can't do it. Um, rapid, mostly automated releases. We do actually have effectively a CI process for doing Atomic Host releases. It's hacked together with string and bash scripts, but it does work. As I said, we build the images every day, we run some tests on them, and the tests gate the release. If the images don't pass the test, they can't get shipped. And we've had this going since Fedora 23, so the process does work. It's a bit janky, but it does work. So our plans, three minutes, yay, are um, basically to do all the stuff I talked about that we don't have. Um, this is very high level stuff. Um, modularity is the concept that Instead of building an entire operating system, every time we build anything, we build an operating system out of a bunch of packages, we want to think about bits, like little components that can be plugged together to make operating systems or to make other things. They can be plugged together to make container images, maybe. They can be plugged together to make flat packs. Um, so just the idea of taking our systems and splitting them up and reorienting them, rewriting them so that they, they can spit out many more different things that can then be plugged together. Factory 2.0 is kind of the overview term for all the modifications we want to make to the overall Fedora release pipeline. It's a lot of the stuff, Factory 2.0 and modularity are kind of bundled together in a sense. It's just this idea that we need to overhaul our pipeline to enable CI, enable modularity, enable us to do a lot of the stuff that we want to be doing now that we couldn't do before. Uh, we had this idea of doing an atomic workstation, which the workstation people are really interested in. So take the atomic host model and apply it to workstation. You get a workstation image which was built on OS tree, and then any software you want to install on it, you'd basically install as a flat pack is the idea. So yeah, it's the Android model. You get a Fedora <coughs> image, and then you install apps on top of it, and the base system gets updated every two weeks. Yes, really quick question. Yeah, I'm very interested in that. Is there any way I could play around with that? Uh, there are actually atomic workstation images being built in CentOS right now, because we don't have the it's, the Fedora pipeline isn't quite set up to build it right now, but yeah, it does exist. Um, Colin Walters is a good person to talk to about it. Come grab me after the talk and I'll talk, talk to you about that. But yeah, you can play with it. Boltron is the code name for, as a very early sort of modularity proof of concept, we want to build a Fedora server release for 27, no, for 26, which is actually built from the modularity stuff we have implemented right now. It won't be a supported image, it's a proof of concept. We're just going to ship it and say, hey, here it is. But we want to get modularity to the point where we can build a Fedora server image using it as a proof of concept. That's what Boltron is. And increased automation CI, yeah, we want to be doing stuff like uh, we're not going to ship a Rawhide Compose unless it at least passes some basic tests. Uh, update, like whenever you do, a we want to do stuff like whenever you have a commit to a package, we're going to run some basic package sanity tests on it. And if they fail, the commit gets rejected. There's a lot of plans in this area, but they're all that kind of 
idea of let's do some automated tests and if they fail, let's not ship this thing, let's not accept this commit. There's a lot of people working on a lot of things in that line, but that's, that's one of our main focuses here. Oh, blah, blah, blah. oh yes, so I'm going to skip that because we don't have time for it, but here is the summary. I don't know if the Suze guys are here, but I just want to control them a little bit. We have this whole ongoing relationship with Suze. It's, it's a joke. I love the Suze guys. I work together with them quite a lot, and their talk is next. So yeah, Fedora was great. Fedora is great. Fedora will always be great, and we all hate Suze. Any questions? <laughs> Okay, can I take a couple questions? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. A quick question. It's all about other distributions. Do anything you ever miss about Mandrake slash Mandriva? Do I miss? Uh, for the rest of the audience, I used to work for Mandrake slash Mandriva, which was, it was kind of the Ubuntu before Ubuntu. It was the user-friendly desktop distribution before Mark Jolof came in and drove us out of business with his giant bags of money. Uh, <laughs> do I miss about it? It was... Not so much because Fedora is quite, working in Fedora is actually quite similar because Fedora is such a small project. Um, I'm a proven packager, so I can commit to almost anything in Fedora. The thing I like the most about Mandrake was just being able to run around and do everything, and I can pretty much do that in Fedora too. I think if I was working on Red Hat, I'd miss it a lot more because Red Hat is much more of a everything gets signed off in triplicate kind of environment, yeah, right? You know, triple approvals. Rides. Like you can't just go check out, you can't just do git check out kernel and make some commits to it. In, Red Hat, but in Fedora, is, it's pretty similar. Yes? Is 32-bit uh, Intel i6? It's 32-bit, um, so i686, like 32-bit Intel, is already, it's not release blocking anymore, um, which is a major change. So we, we run some tests on 32-bit, but if they fail, nothing is going to block the release, so it's already kind of dying. It'll probably be around a long time, because it doesn't cost much to have it in the build system, but it's, it's definitely de-emphasized. I probably wouldn't run it myself, but I was honest with you, it breaks quite a lot. Uh, any more questions? Yes? All right, I have an obscure question. Um, Please, go ahead. Back in the olden days, yes. there used to be an RPM package called Base System, and yes. it, was, it did literally nothing. Uh, it was irrelevant, and everything depended on it. Yeah. Um, do, can you speak to the history of that, and do you still use it? I don't believe there is that package anymore. Um, that's a concept called a meta package. Um, it just exists. It's, it's a way of doing package groups without doing package groups, basically. The idea is you have an empty package with a bunch of dependencies, and the point of it is just to have the dependencies. So if you know it's installed, you know all the other packages are installed. It's a pattern that gets used quite a lot. Um, like kernel is basically a meta package now. The package kernel has almost nothing in it, but it depends on kernel core and uh, like kernel modules, something like that. So that's what that was. I don't think we have it anymore. Uh, I can look. <laughs> I think it's still there. Oh, is it? <laughs> Let's see. RPM Q base system. Let's see. Thank you. Oh, yeah, it is still there. There's no files in it, right? There's nothing in it. Yeah, there's nothing in it. Let's see what it requires. So it's, it's basically what I'm working on. I'm working on limitations or defining.